Okay, right. So we've got 123, and I'll uh, start talking about modes. So, the usual way that you learn about modes is, um, well, there's a standard way that people talk about it, right? So what you'll generally get, and I'll, and I'll get to this later, I'm going to approach it from a different angle. So what you would normally have is somebody would say, okay, for the modes of the major scale, you've got the major scale, C major, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then to create the modes, you take the second uh, note and you start from there, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, you know. And then you work up to E, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, F, G, A, B, C, etc. And you get seven modes from it and blah, blah, blah. Now, the problem with that, I mean, that is how you create the modes. But the problem with that is that doesn't really tell you anything about how you use them, what they're used for. Now, there are a bunch of different uses for modes. One of them is as a chord scale, um, which I'll get into later. You can use them for modal purpose, for modal composition or modal jazz or something like that, where you kind of use it as a key, where you'll have like, let's say, a Dorian scale. And instead of thinking of something in the key of, let's say, C major, so let's say your key is C major, you could do something in C Dorian. You don't really call it a key. You don't really say, oh, it's in the key of C Dorian. Don't know why, it's just traditionally not you know, that's it's just not traditionally done because of the classical tradition, etc. But that is, in effect, what you're doing. You create chords from it. You've got harmony. You've got modal harmony. And just uh, while on the topic of that, uh, I do talk about modal harmony in the latest course in Groove Trainer Volume 2. So I do talk about modal harmony there. And I will touch on that later on. But there, there are a bunch of different ways that you can use it. But what we're going to do today is look at an in, at, at individual modes and what we're really doing if we just use one mode as a scale and how we and how we would generate material from it, right? And I think this is a better way of looking at it because if you just look at it as oh well you create these modes from the major scale it it can be a, just a bit confusing. It's like why are you doing it, right? So we're going to start with the application first uh, with individual modes and then we'll go back to how they're created because the creation of them doesn't really tally. So, okay. First things first. Two scales. Let's just think of two scales. The major scale and a natural minor scale. So uh, you'll all know a major scale. So every, you know, you don't have to have been playing long before you learn a major scale. So let's say a C major. So... C, D, E, F, G, A, B, okay? So, there's a C major scale, and then we could also look at a natural minor scale. That's the standard default vanilla minor scale. So, in on a C, I'm not going to look at A minor for now. We'll, we'll do all of this from C. So, for a C natural minor scale, we'd have C, D, E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, C. So, if you think of what that is relative to a major scale... First two notes are the same, C and D, that's the same as C major, but then it's an E flat instead of an E. That's why you call it a flattened third, it's a minor third. That's what gives it that sad sound. So major, well, bit happy, you know, but then minor, sad. So, so that's that minor third, right? F and G, that's the same as in the major scale, fourth and fifth. Uh, standard perfect fourth, perfect fifth. Uh, it helps to know your intervals. Um, and then, instead of A natural, we've got A flat. Okay, so that's a minor sixth. So, there's another sad note. And then, instead of B at the top, we've got a B flat. Again, that's, well, it's not sad, but it's uh, it's got a harder edge. Instead of, okay. So, that's your major scale and your natural minor scale. And most people, when they learn a minor scale and a major scale, you know, when you first start playing, you can kind of hear the difference. You think, okay, yeah, if I want to play something happy, I can use major. And if I want to play something sad, I can use minor. Okay? So that usually is pretty straightforward for most people. But with modes, for some reason... People just get really, they, they don't look at it like that. They just think, oh, it's related to the major scale and it's these, uh, you know, chord scales and, oh, jazz and 
or, or even worse, they think that it's a way of moving up and down the neck, which is, you can use them like that, but that's not really what they're intended for. So, so what we'll do is we'll look at a few things that are similar to the major scale. So what we'll do is, first of all, we'll look at the Lydian scale and the, and the Mixolydian scale. So I know what you might be thinking if you've not learned any modes before. You might be thinking, oh, no. Greek names, Lydian, Mixolydian, it all sounds kind of fanciful, right? But they're actually really, really straightforward. So let's stick with the major to begin with. So C major, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then back to C. All you do is create a Lydian mode or scale. Modes are scales. Don't think that modes are anything different. They're not. It's just a scale. So a Lydian scale. All we do is we sharpen that fourth degree of the major scale. So if we work up through C major, C, D, E, instead of F, we've got F sharp, okay, that, that tritone in there, okay? So in terms of the frets uh, on a C major, it would be third and fifth on the uh, A string, then second, third and fifth on the D string, and then second, fourth and fifth on the G string. So for the Lydian, it's going to be third and fifth on the A string, then second, fourth and fifth on the D string, and then second, fourth and fifth on the G string. So it's the same as a major scale. The only thing different is that sharp and fourth. You can hear that it's... If I play them quick, it's hard to even tell the difference. So if I play a major scale, and now a Lydian, Okay, you can tell somewhere in the middle of something different, right? So, that's a Lydian scale. And then the Mixolydian is the same as a major scale. But instead of, uh, we don't have a sharp and fourth, but it's the same as a major scale, but with a flattened seventh. So, a Mixolydian scale. So, instead of C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, we've got C, D, E, F, G, A, B flat, C. Okay. So, we've got a major scale, a Lydian scale, and a Mixolydian scale. They're all pretty much the same, apart from one note, right? So, that, that's the first thing to know. So, instead of learning them, you know, like C major, D Dorian, A, E, e uh, Phrygian, blah, blah, blah. instead of doing it like that, learn them on one note. Learn them on the same note, okay? Ignore all that relationship to all the others, you know, and all that working them out from a major. Just learn them as a scale, in isolation, just a separate scale, right? So, next thing. Look at the chord tones. We're going to look at it as a chord scale in this sense. We're just I'm not going to talk about chord progressions yet uh, within a mode. I'm just going to talk about one chord, as if we're playing over a single chord, right? So, in a major scale, look at the first, third, and fifth degrees. So, in a major scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. One, two, three. Three, four, five. C, E, and G. That's the first, the third, and the fifth. And then if you want the seventh, you can add that as well. Okay? So C major, that's a C major triad. So if we play that as a chord. And there with the seventh. Okay? So that's the chord in there. So if you were to play a C major triad, or you were to play a C major seven, oops, play a C major seven chord, and you played that that C major over it, it would work because that's the that's the core of the of the scale, that first, third, and fifth there. That's the that's the skeleton of the scale, okay? The, the other notes in there, the second, the fourth, and the sixth, they're just, you know, the um that's just flesh. <laughs> right? That's just the other stuff around it. So we've got this backbone of the scale. Okay, so that's a C major 7 or a C major triad. So I'll just keep reiterating these things so it cements it in your mind. So C major scale, we've got that C major triad and C major 7. Let's move to the Lydian. Remember what I said? It was C, E, well, sorry, C, T, E, F sharp, G. Look at, the, look at the core triad and look at the core seventh. So we work up through it. C, D, E, F sharp, G. And then the beat, it's the same. It's the same as the major. Major triad. And C major 7. Okay, so the same as the major scale. The only difference is that F sharp in there. Okay? Now look at the Mixolydian. So 
C, D, E, F, G, A, B flat, C. Look at the triad and the seventh chord in there. Again, first, third, and fifth, and first, uh, third, fifth, and seventh. C, D, E, F, G, C major, again. It's the same triad. Seventh's different, we've got that flat seven. So that's gonna be a, a dominant seven, okay? So on a very, very basic level, you can use a C Lydian over a C major chord. You can use a C major scale over a C major chord. You can use a C mixolydian over a C major chord. Seventh is a bit different, so over a C major seven, you could use the major or the Lydian scale, and over the C seven, you've got the mixolydian, because those chords are within there. That They're the backbone of the scale. Now, that doesn't mean you can always, if you ever see a C major seven, you can just randomly use a Lydian or a major, or a, on a dominant seven, you can use a, a mixolydian. There's more to it than that. You know, there's obviously, you learn about harmony, you learn context, you know, where you are in a key and all these kind of things. But for the sake of this, that's all we're looking at. So, we're looking at the core of that mode. So if it's actually easier to think if you want to use a mixolydian scale, you're going to use it over a, you're going to use a C7, okay? So if you're going to make something up, it's going to be a C7 chord. If you're going to use a Lydian, you're going to be using a C major 7 or a C major, okay? So all I'm trying to emphasize here is that there's a core skeleton triad in there, okay? Now, the reason I want to tell you that is because they're going to be the most consonant notes when you're using it. Because you're going to be using it over harmony. It's very rare you're ever going to play anything and there's no harmony involved. Um, so in terms of the harmony, in terms of when you're using this thing, the first, the third, and the fifth, and sometimes the seventh or, you know, or more often the seventh, they're going to be your main points of resolution because they're in the chord. So if you're playing over C major 7 and you're using a, a major scale, the main points of resolution, that the, the, the nice notes, the ones that are going to work, are going to be that root, the third, the fifth, and the seventh, or the root, just the root, third and fifth. You know you're safe on those notes, right? So if you're playing, you know, the, whether it's a bass line or whether it's a solo, if you're playing over that C major... You know those three notes are going to work. Now, if you land on an F, you can't hear it there, but if I was playing over that C major, if I played it, let's say, there's a C major. Can you hear? It's in the major scale, but listen to how it just doesn't sound as, it just doesn't sound right. It's, uh, uh, and it's at least it's not resolving, right? Now, if I was to land on the E, you can hear there, it works because it's it's in the chord. Again, if I try that and I play the G, hear how that's nice and consonant. It works with the chord, again, because it's in the chord. And if I play that and then there's the C, the root note, it works because it's in the chord. Now, if I use the D, the second of the, of the major scale, well, it works. It, it, it's nicer than the F, you know, than the fourth. But it still wants to resolve. Okay? Same for the A. You might want to move it up to the B. Or you might want to move it down to the G. Can you hear how there's a there's tension? Okay, so again. And resolution. Again with the F. Tension and resolution. Okay, so that's a key part of this, tension and resolution. So, back to the mode. So, if we're just on the major scale, we know that we can start a phrase, finish a phrase. I mean, finishing a phrase is often uh, the key to this. But we know that those notes in the, in the triad and the seventh chord are going to work. But, not all music is just made up of triads. And chord tones, you know, non-chord tones are where all the, the real good stuff is. So that's where the characteristic scale steps come in. So I'll get onto that in a minute. So, so let's say that we're going to play uh, a little bass line on a C major, okay? Just because the same things that apply to the major scale apply to 
Lydian, Mixolydian, Dorian, Frisian, Spanish Frisian, whatever it is. It's the same thing. You want to look at the chord tones and treat those as your points of uh, resolution. But the other notes, the second, the fourth, and the sixth in the scale, they're the character notes. They're the ones that are going to add the modality in there. So when we use something like a, a Lydian scale, that F sharp is, the ca is, is one of the characteristic scale steps. If you want it to sound Lydian, the Simpsons, that's, you know, you want to use that, uh, that non-chord tone, but you'll probably want to resolve it. Can you hear how that F sharp in the Lydian, it wants to resolve? This is how to use those non-chord tones. You want to think of tension and resolution. Now, you might want the tension. You might want it to hold on. You might want it to sound like that. You might want to just hold on that. But there's no getting around it. There is going to be the pullback to that fifth. No matter, no matter what you do, it's going to be pulling it in, right? That gravity to that fifth, okay? Okay, a bit of West Side Story there. So you use those non-chord tones as melodic devices so you can work if you think of the triad and the and the seventh chord um you know the chord tones you can use these non-chord tones in different ways you could use them as passing notes so i'm just making up a basic melodic line right so that's c d e i'm using the d in there and it works because i'm resolving to the third and then again i'm res I'm, I'm not holding on the d you can hold on it, you know, to get that sound, you know, if you want to, if you want to hold there, but the reason that it, that it sounds like that is because of the uh, tension. So you can use them as passing notes. There's the fourth, you know, that one sounded awful, didn't it? But in passing, sorry about the fret buzz. <laughs> this thing needs looking at. Okay. I'm going up. I'm coming down. So I'm just using them as passing notes. And then from the G up to the B. So this is the fifth up to the seventh. This is all major scale. We're not on the Lydian yet. You can also use neighbor notes. So that's being on a chord tone. Go into the next one and back. So if I'm on a C major. So. And I go. You know, there's a fill. That's a. That's a neighbor note. C, G, C, chord tones, root, fifth, root. Up to that second and back. So we get the tension and the character. Don't just think of it as tension. Don't think of it as a bad thing. It's just characterful. And then back, back to the C. Okay. So that's how we can use chord tones. Um, uh, sorry, non-chord tones. So then if you're on the C, so if I'm here on the C major, so there's the E, the third of the chord, up to the F and back. So this is how to use the non-chord tones. So when somebody was asking before that they know about the modes, they kind of get the form, but they don't know how to use them. Well, you can use those non-chord tones. I mean, basically, use the chord tones. Use the, the basic first, third, and fifth, and seventh of the mode, be it in a bass line, a fill, a melody, a solo, whatever it is. But then use the non-chord tones around them okay so there's the third up to the fourth and back so nice consonant so if i was to play the c major there and f and back so we get the sus suspension there or so there E, F, G, so third, fourth, fifth, passing note in between. And then neighbor note. And then back. So I'm, I'm working around the chord tones. I know I'm going over and over it again, you know, reiterating the point. But so with the chord tones, just, just chord tones on their own, that's a C major arpeggio, but adding a few non chord tones. So I'm putting that fourth in there, maybe the second. OK, 
Okay. So this is all just the major scale. You know, that's all we're doing. I'm, I'm just showing you how to uh, use the non-chord tones and the chord tones in that scale. You know, how to make use of them. But the same thing applies to the modes. So if we now look at the Lydian scale, so the C, D, E, F sharp, that's all we're doing. We the only thing we're changing is the uh, is the F sharp. Hold on, somebody just said I've lost audio. Let me just check that this is still coming through. Are you all still getting audio, first of all? You still getting it? Everybody got audio? Oh, still working, okay. Phew. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so uh, Lydian. So C, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, and up to the C. So instead of just thinking of it as some C or whatever, a scale thing where you go, oh. You know, just blah, 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 up and down. Oh, yeah, I can play scalar lines. Instead of thinking about it like that, you need to look at it as a set of chord tones, the first, third, fifth, and seventh, with these extra non-chord tones, which are the character notes, characteristic scale steps in there, and then you use those around there. So, now if we take the Lydian, so we've got the C. I'll play it up here so you can hear it a little bit better. There's that C major triad, and now let's add the F sharp, the sharp and fourth in there, that characteristic scale step, as a passing note. Hear how different that sounds. We've got a lot of that tension there. If I play that just as the F again, just the normal fourth. Oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints. <laughs> it turns when the saints go marching in. Into the Simpsons. So we've got that's the root third, fourth, and fifth in a major scale. And then if we did it with the Lydian, so you get it's just got a different sound. And you'll hear this in you hear it in film music all the time. You know, movies have got John Williams stuff. You'll hear Lydian things. has a certain kind of, I, I, I wouldn't say a sci-fi sound, it just has this kind of, um, oop, lead fell out, um, it just has a kind of, um, what's the word, like a mystical kind of sound, it just has a different vibe altogether, so, so if I was to play up through that again, there's the major seven arpeggio, and now with that uh, sharp and fourth, I'm just putting it in there. Here how it just gives us a different kind of sound. So that's Lydian, okay? So it's all about the sharp four. If you don't use that sharp four, you wouldn't really be able to say that it's Lydian, right? It's only Lydian if you're using that sharp and fourth. So mix a Lydian, remember what I said? Major scale, flatten the seventh, so. This one's got more of a bluesy kind of sound. So the chord there would be C7. So we've got the dominant seven chord as the core seventh chord. We've got a major triad. Again, just the same as the major scale. But because of the sixth in there, the major sixth and all that, if you want to use this, uh, the mixolydian, you just have, you have to make use of that flat seven. So basically, we're still sticking with chord tones. It, you know, the core chord tone there is actually the characteristic scale step. But, you know, so is the major six there. Okay, so mixolydian, if you want to use a mixolydian scale, you just flatten that seventh and just make, you make use of it. And you'll see this in lots of pop and rock tunes where you've got something like a major chord and then you'll suddenly see it drop down to the flat seven major chord. You get it all the time. So if you've got a song in C major and the first, and you've got chord one C major, and then it drops down to like a B flat major. That's not in the key of C major. That's making use of that mixolydian. Uh, you can use it over a blues pretty much. You know, if you're an F seven, um, instead of using Instead of just using an, an F blues throughout the whole thing, which, you know, it's not going to work if 
if there's no chords playing in the background. But if you, you know, ideally you'd use the chord tones. So you can use that Mixolydian scale in things like blues or, you know, anything where it's got that dominant seven chord, or even if it's the major triad, but it's got that flat seven chord in there. Okay, so Mixolydian's very, very popular. Like I said, it's just a major scale with that flat and seventh. So can you see how this is working? Again, you make use of melodic um, devices. You know, if I'm on that C there, C, C7, we've got that B flat in there. So let's say that I was going to add one of the uh, non-chord tones just as a passing note. Let's say the, the fourth. Okay, so C, E, F, G, B flat. Straight away, it has a different kind of sound to the major. Okay, so it's because we're not just sticking to chord tones. If all you do is stick to chord tones... I mean, I added some more there, but you, you end up with this very bluesy kind of sound. But when you start adding the other notes in there, like the fourth... Yeah, how different that sounds. Or uh, I've got the sixth in there, which does give it that kind of, you know, it gives it that rock and roll kind of vibe. Second, if I was to just use the second, so this is the dominant seven arpeggio with the second. You suddenly get a completely different flavor, so. Okay, so this is how you make use of non-chord tones, which are the modal notes. They're the things that, that, they're the character notes that you get in modes. So a mode is going to be a basic stru chord structure, a major triad, minor triad, whatever it is, a major seven, a minor seven, dominant seven. But it's those non-chord tones, the second, the fourth, and the sixth degrees of the scale that give it the modality. And they, they determine that sound and that flavor. And you use these things for the flavor. Now, like I said, you can use these as basic diatonic um, uh, chord scales. You can use them to play through, you know, if you've got a 1, 6, 2, 5 in C major, you can think, okay, chord 1 is C major, chord 6 is A Aeolian, chord 2 is D Dorian, and chord 5 is G Mixolydian. Yes, you can do that, but in terms of composition and, and the actual the real nature of how people make use of, of modal music, you know, if you're going to do it in composition wise you know like i said about all the film scoring and stuff like that um if you're going to make chord progressions out of it if you're going to play modal jazz you really want to be looking at it as the core structure you know because I, let's say that you're playing in a in a it's a modal piece like a modal jazz piece you might have the same mode the same chord let's say it's going to be d d minor seven you could have that for hours just on that one on that one chord and you might just, I mean, you'll be using the Dorian scale over that. So you might have to just use that for ages. You're not thinking in terms of other chords necessarily. It's, it's one chord and you're just using that, that mode for that, uh, that period of time. So that's three major type uh, modes. Uh, like I said, don't worry about how they're related to any other keys. You know, just learn them as individual modes. Learn the flavor. Learn the flavor of Lydian. Learn the flavor of Mixolydian. And try making up bass riffs. Just a standard bass riff. So if I was to play, uh, like just make something up. So if we were to take the uh, Lydian scale. So let's say we play D Lydian. So like I said, you need to make use of that uh, sharp and fourth. So... basic riff you can probably come up with root fifth octave and then sharp fifth and back in i'm making use of non-chord tones but look what i'm doing i'm resolving that non-chord tone that's the key to making use of these characteristic scale steps what's the one that i i, I once wrote a composition back years ago uh, yeah, that was it. I used it for this modal piece that I did. And that was the bass line. And 
does this weird melody over the top. But, you know, I'm using the seventh there, the major seventh. Third, fourth, fifth. And you can hear it's got that, that, uh, that Lydian sound. So just try making up riffs. Just but work around the chord. The key is to work around the chord tones. Base it around the chord tones and use those characters, the, the non-chord tones, to resolve back to your chord tones. Because you know you'll be safe if you land back on a chord tone. So that's what you want to do. Um, with the Mixolydian. So what I'm doing there is I'm just using that root and the flat seven, and then I'm putting that uh, that little that uh, that major third at the end there. So. Now, obviously, you can use other things like chromatics and things all around this. You don't have to just stick to those. You can, you know, like then I was using a minor third into a major third. Or you could... You can add things in between, you know, in between. You can add the chromatics between the, uh, the, uh, the uh, scalar notes. But, you know... You still want to really outline the, the those characteristic scale steps. I mean, I keep reiterating it. Those characteristic scale steps. If you want a nice book about all of this stuff, then uh, 20th Century Harmony by Vincent Persichetti is a really a really good one. We had to um, that was one of our main textbooks at at uh, university, and it, you know we used it for arranging and composition and stuff. And there's a nice chapter on modal harmony in there. It goes into all of this stuff to do with characteristic scale steps, how to create harmony from all of this stuff, how, how you use it all. But that's 20th Century Harmony by Vincent Persichetti. If you're an absolute beginner, it might, <laughs> might go over your head a little bit. But if you really want to deep dive in this stuff, then there's some real good stuff in there. There's like harmonic projections as well and all kinds of stuff. It's really, it's really interesting stuff. Um, but only if you've, you know, if you've been playing a few years at least. Um, so, um, oh, and someone's just mentioned that a lot of this stuff's in the scales course. So yeah, so um, how I said that there's a, a, a sale on over at the uh, over at the website at the moment. If you really want to deep dive into all this stuff and how to apply these all over the fretboard and how to apply them in bass lines and all that kind of stuff, the scale essentials course is the one to do. I'd probably recommend chord tone essentials first because chord tones are the, you know, the they're the backbone of these modes. And like I introduced the uh, the chord tones first, that's the points of resolution. All of the other stuff all these scalar notes, characteristic scale steps, blah de blah de blah that works around that chord tone framework. So you want to get the chord tones down first. Really, you want to learn about intervals first, but you learn intervals, chord tones, and then the scale steps come into play, and that's where you can learn about these modes. But you can see already that you can just create a bass line, a bass riff, or a melody, or a whatever you want, on a mode by making use of those characteristic scale steps, and the chord tones. Use the chord tones as your points of resolution. If you've ever tried doing this and it just hasn't sounded very good, it's probably because you're not seeing the bigger picture, that you're not seeing the harmony there, you're not seeing the chord tones and the, you know, how things resolve. That's probably where most people go wrong with it. You know, you just start running lines um, and that's probably a bad way to do it. If you just try isolating the chord tones, working around, so if it was a major seven, so if you get used to that, there's a C major seven. So major seven arpeggio, you get used to the sound of that, but then, then I can start putting in that Lydian, that sharp four. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the two major ones, the Lydian and the Mixolydian, so they're very similar to major. The other ones that you want to learn are the minor ones. Uh, I won't talk about Locrian so much because that's it's hard to use. There's not many pieces that make use of Locrian, especially authentically. Uh, but the other ones are the minor ones. Now you've got the natural minor, which I've already gone through. C, D, B flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, C. So one, two, flat three, four, five, flat six, flat seven. Um, that minor third, minor sixth, and the minor seventh in there are going to give you that sound. So remember what I said. Again, we'll look at the, the natural minor first before moving into the modes. So we've got the 
minor triad, that first, flat three and five, as our core skeleton of the, of the scale, we can add the flat seven in there as well. Okay, so that's that's the heart of that uh, of that uh, natural minor, and then the non-chord tones are where we get all that flavour. So, okay, see there, there's the fifth, there's the flat sixth. So I'm playing the G, the A flat, back to the G. There's the arpeggio, the triad, sixth and back. Neighbour notes. I'm using melodic devices to work around it. So, and instantly you've got a little bit of a melody, right? I could also use the second, so just to join, just to join that root and th the flat third. Instant little melodic phrase. Going back down. There's the fifth, so again, I'm just using the chord tones. Third, root, and fifth, but adding the second in there. I'm starting on a chord tone and I'm finishing on a chord tone. You don't have to do that, but that's the best way to get used to it because if you don't do that then you're going to be you're going to be messing with dissonance you know it's not going to sound like it's uh, resolving so again with the sixth there's that flat seven for the chord tone okay so if i was to make up a little bass line a repetitive thing simple. I'm just making up something and putting in that flat six, but I'm resolving, okay? That's root and fifth, C and G, chord tones. And that flat sixth in there that I move to and come back with the neighbor note gives us that little bit of flavor. So that's the natural minor again. Got the minor seven at the heart of it. Dorian, okay? So Dorian's the most Keep <laughs> pull the leader. So, Dorian's the most uh, common of the minor uh, modes, you know, other than the natural minor. Uh, natural minor, by the way, is also known as the Aeolian mode. Don't worry if you don't want to remember that, <laughs> but that is what it is. When you work through the modes in a major scale, the natural minor is the same as the Aeolian. Dorian is the same as the natural minor, but with a major sixth in it. So, C natural minor again, just work through that. C, D, E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat. There's that natural minor. Now let's sharpen that sixth. So one, two, three, four, five. Instead of the A flat, we've got the A natural. So you could play the A there at the 7th fret of the D string, or you could play it there at the 2nd fret of the G string. A lot of people like to play it like that. I tend to, with that first finger pattern, I tend to use that. But it is a bit of a stretch for some people. Um, I just like seeing all the notes in that. I like seeing them in that one area. But uh, So that's the Dorian. So again, just learning it as a scale and just running lines... You know, is a little bit useless. You're not going to play that ever in anything. But if we take those chord tones, remember what I said. It's the minor triad. We got the minor seven in there as well. Same as the natural minor. So harmonically, it's the same as the natural minor. But the only difference is that non-chord tone. It's that a, a uh, natural. So... Okay, there's the sound, there's the characteristic scale step. So on the natural minor, there's the flat six and here it's got a little bit of a different sound. There it is. And now again with the natural minor. So if I was to just work around that, uh, that fifth of it, there's the flat six and now it sounds a little bit odd when you actually return back to the fifth it actually sounds more usable when you actually move up to the flat seven so that's dorian whereas 
mm. hear the difference. The natural minor's got more of a just a basic minor sound, you know. Whereas the Dorian's got this kind of funky sound, and you'll hear it in that. That's the major. Six. That's Dorian. If you use it, I mean, it's the same as the Mixolydian, actually, but with a minor third instead of a major third. So, minor third in there, major six to the uh, flat seven. That's all Dorian. You couldn't, you wouldn't use natural minor. <laughs> it, it just doesn't sound, it's too sad. Um, Dorian is used all the time. That note, that that major six to the flat seven is Dorian. Okay. Now, in a lot of metal and rock tunes, you're probably more likely to see the. I say probably, probably more likely to see the uh, natural minor. You're more likely to get that kind of thing. Whereas in funk stuff, that's Dorian. So Dorian's going to be more funk and pop oriented, whereas the natural mind is going to be more rock metal kind of thing. You know, that kind of thing. So that's Dorian. Now, uh, once again, remember, it's all about the chord tones in the middle. If you're going to write lines or you're going to write, like if you're going to write bass lines or melodies or anything like that, work around the chord tones. That's, that's, the, that's at the core of this. They're your main points of resolution. They're the happy notes. They're the, not the happiness, so they're not a minor. They're, they're the, um, they're the uh, safe notes, let's say. So uh, another thing that you'll hear with uh, Dorian is where it moves. You'll get that. Uh, you know that kind of marking that that's Dorian so that uh, that Dorian thing like I said is going to be more funk based work around the chord tones and then resolve I mean uh, with a lot of those things like I was playing then that because the sixth um, it's not like the fourth, where the fourth, um, you know, there's that, there's a, there's that horrible dissonance between the third of the chord and the, and the fourth, and the perfect fourth. You don't get that with the major sixth. It kind of works out quite nice. So if you're on a, let's say, a, uh, uh, well, I'll do this tap in. Uh, so if we've got a C minor seven, and then we want, I don't know, probably, uh, where's the best way to do this? So C minor seven, and then I want to put an A in it. So... Actually, that's, <laughs> that's a bad example, isn't it? If I just try and land on that A, it, you, can, you can use that and just hold on it, but in a bass line rather than a melody. Like if you're on a solo, you can kind of go, you know, that, that, so that sounds kind of nice. But uh, if you're on a bass line, you're probably going to want to jump back to the chord tones. You know, you're going to be around. That, that A is going to either want to go there or that A to B flat. The A to the B flat, because it's a half step, is going to work better. So that's Dorian. Then Phrygian is the same as the natural minor again. I'm, remember, I'm always reverting to the natural minor. Remember, that's the vanilla default minor scale. Phrygian's the same again as the natural minor, but this time we've got a flattened second. So this gives you that kind of Spanish kind of vibe. So, so if I'm up here... Okay, so... Can you know, we've got that... Okay, so that's the Phrygian. That's the only difference between that and the natural minor. So again, I mean, certainly with this one, you're going to want to, <laughs> you don't want to hang around on the flat second. You're going to want to resolve it either to the root notes or, or 
uh, or to the third. So, so again, you know, got that kind of metal kind of vibe. Jaws. It's got that flat second in there. So, uh, but it's all based around around that minus seven again. But see, if you use it in passing, it works. The rest of it is the same as the natural minor. Uh, and like I said, the Locrian, that's that's the same as the Frisian, but we've got a flat five in there as well. But it's a little bit harder to use that because it's got a minus seven flat five at the core, which is hard to use as a re as a resolution. Now, I'm not going to go too much further with this. I mean, the main thing to know is that when you've got that set of modes, if you can just learn each of them in isolation, you don't really have to start thinking about how they relate back to the major scale. Um, you can use them in isolation like that for the flavor. Now, I would advise doing that and actually learning them, you know, on a, on a single note, on a single C. So C major, C Lydian, C Mixolydian, C natural minor, C Dorian, C Phrygian. Learn them like that. And then when it comes to going a little bit further with it and actually then seeing them within a key, you know, how, you, how they're derived, it'll make a lot more sense because then you know what those scales are. So when you work through them and, it, and you know, if I then was to say, okay, well, we've got C major, key of C major. If we play from D up through there, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, and we play it here, that's D Dorian. You already know a D Dorian scale. You can see it. Then next up, E Phrygian. You've already practiced it in isolation. F Lydian. Oops. G Mixolydian, that's the fifth mode. A Aeolian, which is the natural minor. And then finally B Locrian. And then we're back to C major. So. Can you see why learning them in isolation to begin with and learning what the flavor is, how the chord tones relate to it, how you use them, it actually makes a lot more sense than starting from, oh, we've got this major scale and then you build these modes from it. And then and then what? You don't know how, how to use them. You don't know about the chord tones within there. You don't know about the characteristic scale steps, about the consonants, the dissonance, blah, de, blah, de, blah. Learning them this way you learn them in isolation, first of all. Just learn them as a scale on the, it, you know, in their own right. You know, when you learn a natural minor scale, when you, you know, when you first start out, usually the first two scales that you're going to learn are going to be major and natural minor. You might learn a major and minor pentatonic as well. But you don't sit there learning about how a minor pentatonic relates to a major scale. You don't learn how a natural minor scale is the sixth mode of the major scale. You know, you, you don't have to do that. You just learn it in its own right. And I think that's the best way to go with these modes. I know I've kind of gone round the houses with it, you know, introducing all this stuff to do with consonants and dissonance and tension and release and blah, you know. But when you actually come down to mess around with these, and basically that's what you want to do, just mess around with them. You know, don't don't get too academic with it. Just, you know, work around the, get a rhythm, work around the actual chord tones to begin with, and then start bringing some of those extra non-chord tones into play. Um, and you'll just get used to them. You know, a lot of you already will probably prefer, you know, without even thinking of modes, chord tones or anything, a lot of you will probably, when you're coming up with something, are probably going to go flat seven to root note. So, you know, it's, you know, you really got me, you know. It's, it's the kind of go-to for anybody that's learning rock or pop or anything like that because it, it doesn't have that kind of bittersweet sound of that major seven. You know, you're less likely to do that. You're less likely to go. You're more likely to go. And you might just do that instinctively, you know, by ear. You think, oh, yeah, I like that sound. You know, because you've learned a bass line that's like that. You might have learned an end twizzle bass line or a... You know, whatever it is, McCartney bass line, and, and it's using that. 
because you've learned that. That's part of your vocabulary. Well, as soon as you start learning these things, you start seeing where all of that stuff comes from. You know, just mess around with it. Okay? So I think I'll leave it there. I was going to talk about harmony, but I think that might be getting a bit ahead of ourselves. I think it's going to get a bit heavy <laughs> if we start talking about modal harmony. I mean, if you want to get into that, the best the, the best thing I can say really is just as you create chords from a major scale, a major key, you know, if you're in the key of C major and you've got the chords, C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor, B diminished, and C major, that's your set of chords, that's your palette of chords within the key. You can do the same thing with modes. And um, that's where it starts to get quite interesting and uh, quite cool because you can actually create chord progressions within a mode. And, uh, you know, you're not using the mode melodically per se in that sense. Um, I mean, you, I suppose you are, but you're actually creating harmony. And then, you, I mean, you could just stick to using the chord tones then. You don't even have to think about characteristics, girl steps and modal things. You just create the chord, just create the chords and stick to the chord tones and you're, and you're in a mode, you know. Um, but I, I won't get into that too much there. Uh, you can, you know, if you want to work those out yourself, it's dead easy to do. Just work out the chords in a Dorian scale and bob your uncle. So, um, yeah, so did that, did that make sense? Because <laughs> I know everybody gets confused by modes. You see it all the time, and the thing that oh, the thing that really annoys me is when guitarists, especially, start talking about modes, and they talk about them as ways of whipping around the fretboard. And I, as much as I absolutely love Billy Sheehan, um, a bass player, you know, he was one of my heroes. But one of the things that he talks about in it was an old VHS video I had of him back in the early nineties, and uh, you know I was gobsmacked by it at the time, and it just you know freaked me out completely. Just the, you know he's playing, but there was something he said about modes in that, and he said, oh, you know, as soon as I learned about modes, I, it, you know, everything made sense, and I was able to move around the neck. I was like, all oh, right, okay, modes are for doing that, and they're not at all. It's um, you know, if you're playing in C major, you're playing in C major. You're not playing D Dorian. You know, you think about a pianist, that's the way to look at it. If a, if a pianist is running up a, a scale, you know, in fours or fives or sixes or sevens or whatever, and he goes, doo -doo 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 is he really thinking about C major, then D Dorian, then E Phrygian, then F Lydian, then G Mixolydian, then A A Lydian, then B Locrian? No, he's not. He's thinking about C major and he's just going, doo -doo 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 so it, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, misleading to think of them as ways of moving around the neck. There is a way you can do that. You can treat it as a kind of, you know, hack. But um, I would definitely uh, advise against it. Even though it works for Billy Sheehan, who just, you know, is a complete freak. You know, <laughs> he blasts around all over the place. Complete virtuoso using exactly the thing I've just told you not to do. But it's um, still. Anyway, let's, uh, let's see. I've been on for an hour now. Whoop. Um, okay, so I'll move... So just any question and answer before I go. So remember, like I said, we've got a sale on over at uh, Talking Bass at the moment, 25% off everything. And um, if you want to deep dive in any of this stuff, I mean, any of you that have bought any of the courses before, you know how, <laughs> how much of a deep dive they actually are. So Scale Essentials really gets into this. I mean, the minimum size of the courses is usually 10 hours of video. So you can imagine going on for 10 hours, you know, waffling on about this stuff. There's quite a lot <laughs> to get through. Um the simple steps to sight reading is 25 hours of video. So there's a, there's a lot in there. Um, and if you want to deep dive into all of that modal stuff, and I, actually in the scale essentials, I don't just talk about modes, I talk about synthetic scales as well. Um, everything, you know, chromatic scales, whole tone scale, diminished scales, um, and how you apply them all over the neck. And uh, so there's scale essentials, chord tone essentials is the absolute deep, deep dive into harmony. That's the one where I talk about all of the chord construction principles. If you want to learn anything about harmony and any, you know, if ever you hear me talking about dominant seven arpeggios and nine arpeggios and add nine arpeggios and blah, 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 blah. And that, and that doesn't mean anything to you. Then the chord tone essentials one is the way to go. And it, the cool thing about chord tone essentials is in the third module of it or fourth module. Can't remember. 
um, I, I think, yeah, third module of it, I talk um, about how to apply it to bass lines and solos and fills. So you get a lot of creative use out of it. Um, there's Technique Builder as well, if you want to build your technique. I've just got the Groove Trainer course out, uh, Volume 2. So there's all that stuff, so you can just work through a lot of bass lines. I talk about modal harmony in that as well. But like I said, I won't waffle on about that too much. But that's the sale that's going on at the moment. For It's the spring sale, so there's 25% off everything. Okay, so we'll go back up through these comments. Oh, and Walters said exactly what I just said. <laughs> All the mode stuff is in the scale course. You will probably want the chord tone course prior to the scale course. So that's exactly what I said. Um, when does the dominant seventh not work? Um, I don't know what you mean by that, Lenny. Um, one thing that somebody said I saw on Jeff Berlin's bass education thing. Um, somebody was asking about uh, well not asking about that it was stating something and he was talking about the dominant seven as if the dominant seven i don't forgive me if if i'm completely getting you wrong with this but some people think that the dominant seventh just means the minor seven interval there but it doesn't a dominant seven chord it's not a seventh chord it's a dominant seven chord i know that sounds like nitpicking you know between seven and seventh but a seventh is an interval seven is the chord so it's a dominant seven chord and it's called a dominant seven chord because there's only one of that chord type in the major key, in, in a key right and it's on chord five and uh, in terms of classical um, tradition and um, harmony um, in fact I'll just whip through this because you might not know this and because there's 146 of you and it's probably a good chance to actually let you know you know when you hear about tonic and dominant and all that stuff all that is is just the naming of the scale tones uh, just in a in a uh, you'll you'll see it in how many textbooks you know if you just work through any kind of classical theory thing so C major so let's say we're in the key of C major you got the scale degrees one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Not intervals, scale degrees, right? Scale degrees are different from intervals. Um, scale degrees, so the first scale degree is C, the second is D, third is E, fourth is F, etc. Well, in classical tradition, they've got names. So one is the tonic, right? I'm sure you've heard that. Two is the supertonic. You've probably not heard that. Three is the mediant. Again, you've probably not heard that one. Uh, the fourth is the subdominant. Fifth is the dominant. That's where that chord name comes from. Sixth is the submediant. And then the seventh is the leading tone. So again, so we've got tonic, supertonic, mediant, mediant, subdominant, dominant, uh, submediant, leading tone, and in. Okay, back to the tonic. So that's why we call the tonic the tonic. It's the classical name for the first and the dominant is the classical name for the fifth and because the only chord in a major key is chord five that's why it's called the dominant seventh chord it's the seven chord built on the dominant degree so just in case any of you didn't know that that probably will uh, help a lot with <laughs> you know learning well actually you'd i mean I, I, I just think that people get confused between the intervals because, like I said, this guy was talking about um, about the dominant seventh interval, and it's not. The dominant is the fifth degree of the scale. The dominant seven chord is a particular... It's a root, major third, perfect fifth, and minor seventh. Um, now, I don't know if that's what Lenny's insinuating there. It, pr probably not. <laughs> it's just that it reminds me of what uh, what I saw on that comment before um okay steven says just a little worried that i can't understand any of this <laughs> i've been playing for years without lessons maybe i should give up no 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 um the thing to learn is, uh before any of this is probably intervals um but even if you don't learn the theory side of it you know sat there thinking about you know different intervals like the augmented fourth and the minor seventh and dominant seven chords and major seven chords all that kind of stuff if you just learn them as patterns basically and then just think first third and fifth and seventh as being the the go-to notes and then everything around it has been you know um tensions that's the way to look at it. 
Watts has been comfortable with the chord tones, really opened the door for me to start to get this stuff. I'm no expert, but at least I get the basics of modes now. Yeah. They're not difficult. It's just a scale, like a major scale. That's all you're going to think. But it's but even if you show somebody a major scale, how do they use it? You know, what do they do with a major scale? You know, they just end up... A lot of people will just use it as an exercise. You know, just running up and down it. But there's a lot more to a major scale. I mean, it's the basis of a key for a start. But, uh, you know, in terms of creating melodies and bass lines and fills and blah, 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 blah improvising, it's all about the actual chord tones in there learn to improvise and or create things with chord tones first and then start adding the scale notes around it so what was written around d dorian mode uh gave them for me yep yep although it does move up to e flat as well so it's d dorian and it goes to e flat dorian um Mike used to use guitar or piano backing tracks to help explain explain concepts. Without backing tracks, it's hard uh, tracks. It's harder to follow what you're explaining. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I do that on the videos, obviously. Um, but uh, you know, just showing you melodically here, it's uh, it's a little bit harder to do. I should have hooked up the iPod actually. But even then, you pr you you probably don't need it. I mean, the main thing is, you, you know, you can hear there. <laughs> that flat six you can tell the difference between that and that major sixth it's like that's the best way to describe the dorian um thanks lonely longhorn Frisian sounds toolish to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll get the Frisian thing in a lot of metal things. Although, I do have to say that a lot of metal tunes don't really work around any one particular scale most of the time. Most, I mean, I know this as well just from, you know, experience of being in a lot of metal bands back in the 90s. I, it's very rare that anybody's going to come up with riffs based on functional harmony and things like that. That's not what happens. It's usually based on finger patterns, to be honest. And just playing just going with where it, it's what sounds right you know um you know if you get a that kind of flat five kind of thing that that you'll hear in loads of metal or the the flat seven you you get that um in metal just based on intervals it, it's basically learning intervals and then moving around because i mean you're basically dealing with just chromatics there it's, it's just patterns that they're moving around you can just put anything you want in and just you think you think more rhythmically when you're coming up with um rock and metal stuff whenever you analyze something like a metallica riff or a megadeth riff or like a tool riff or, or whatever Slayer, Sepultura, anything like that. You've got to remember that a lot of the chords they're using are power chords, which are, are fifths. I mean, Carcass might use, <laughs> you know, uh, flat fives instead of instead of normal fifths. But um, a lot of it's going to be power chords. Now, the very fact that you got that perfect fifth in there is going to mess things up when you're looking at things like Locrian. Because sometimes people say, oh, that metal tune's in a Locrian mode most of the time it's not because they're actually still if you if you go to the flat five like that you the top note of the chord is a fifth that isn't in a locrian mode so it is just patterns it's just finger patterns and you know following your ear and you know like one of the bands i used to be in a band called exile um one of the guitarists uh lee wood was um phenomenal like really really top-notch guitar in fact both guitarists were fantastic um, it was very much a uh, um, similar to Maiden, similar to a uh, little bit of cacophony here and there. It's, it had, um, you know, typical speed metal guitar kind of thing. And the, you know, I, I, the, the riffs that they would come up with, um, even though, I mean, Woody, I, w I, was at, I was at music college with these guys originally. And it's, you know, he knows all this stuff. You know, he's like, we, we did jazz at college, you know, but we were doing all this metal stuff. And 
even then, he wasn't thinking functional harmony. It's easy to think that they're actually being more clever than they are. It's not at all. It's just finger patterns most of the time. You know, even if you look at Meshuggah and, you know, animals as leaders, all these different things, they're, they're basically coming up with finger patterns. It's, 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 it's not as, um, you know... Um, they're not analysing it first. They're not coming up with like a concept, like some modal. I mean, they could, sometimes it might be, but it, but it is rare. It's usually just based on finger patterns. Um. Well, it says way easier to learn this way. Oh, I just flatten the seventh. I get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's all you've got to think. Just think. Oh, Lydian sharp four. Do do ding. Um. I struggle in a chord progression when they tr uh, uh, with when to get away from the chord root and main key scale and start using the tasty bits. Everything that stems from chord tones. If you know chord construction principles, and trust me, it's not hard. You like. <laughs> I remember learning the basics of chord construction. I mean, remember, I played um, piano and organ and stuff like that before I started bass, not to any high level, but I kind of knew a bit about chords. But you just learn a chord, like a B7 or something like that. You just learn a, a B7 and then a D minor and a G major and whatever. You just learn the chords. You, do, you didn't really learn about how they were constructed so to me even when i went to music college i was still thinking that it was all some kind of mystical thing you know that just chords came out of the ether or something but then i remember one lesson in particular um and i can i can i mean i, I know it was in the winter it was dark outside we we're all sat there it was an arranging lesson and the arranging tutor um who gave me a job later on he actually got me into uh, music teaching he explained the basics of triad and and seventh chord construction um out of thirds so it's called tertian harmony but he explained the basics of it and i just remember being sat there and it was like everything just made sense all of a sudden it was like i could suddenly create any chord it was like all you know when you see chord symbols and you see c major seven sharp five uh, or g7 flat 9 sharp 9 flat 13 or something like that all of a sudden just in this one one hour lesson it all made sense and that all this stuff that i go on and about here it's all fr stems from that one lesson um and it was it was great it was just this like light bulb moment i'd never had a light bulb moment before <laughs> i'd never had anything like that where i just thought oh my god you know because it's so easy, once you get it, it's so easy, it's so simple, the, it, it's not rocket science, it's just, you're building thirds, if you know a third, a major third and a minor third, that's it, that's, that's it, that's all you need to know to start on um, functional, heart. well, just the basics of harmony, and then you just add notes to it, that's, that's it, so you basically learn your triads, then your seventh chords, then you go ninth, eleventh, thirteenth as the extensions, then you might learn added note chords, which is basically add nine, um, uh, added six, and also six nine, and the minor version of that, minor six, minor, add nine, uh, minor six nine, and then suspended chords, you've just got the sus four, you can also have a, you know, seven sus four as well, sus two chords if you really want to get funky, and that's it, you know, anything else is just added to it, like flat nine, or sharp eleven, and stuff like that that's just either a you're either taking a second a fourth or a sixth and then you just sharpening or flattening it and that is it and i know i've kind of i didn't dwell on any of that but basically the things that i just said that's all you need to learn and it's done and then you can all the chord symbols that you'll ever see in the real book or any of these you know any jazz things that you see even classical stuff any chord symbols that you see you'll know what that chord is you'll be able to you know rifle off the the notes that are in it Makes it good for when you're playing piano or something, because then you can just mech them up, you know. You can just go, oh, right. So even if you don't get a good voice in, you know, if it's a, like a, a G7 flat 9, you can at least think, oh, it's a G7 with a flat ninth, you know, which I know sounds really, really obvious when I say it like that. Oh, it's a G7 with a flat 9. But if you don't know the basic chord co construction principles before that, then it, you know, you want to where to start. So, uh, yeah. Um, 
Okay, so everybody seems... Single coil or split coil for my jazz bass. Um, uh, for your jazz bass, um, what, in terms of uh, having humbucking uh, pickups? I mean, it depends whether you... If you like the single coil sound, it's all about what you want, you know. <laughs> Neither of them are better. It's like single coil is going to give you a bit of hum most of the time. Uh, split coil is going to uh, humbuck. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be getting rid of the sound. Um, I, um, when I used to work a lot in theatres and doing cruise gigs and all those kind of things, anything where you've got like a lot of lights above you. Um, originally, my Fender Jazz had split coil, uh, sorry, single coil pickups, and it was noisy. And I got humbucking pickups simply because of that. And it did get rid of a lot of it. Um, one thing that you do have to be aware of is shielding. So you might want to get some copper tape and actually shield out your uh, the internal cavities because do that on a single coil base and you can actually get rid of a lot of that interference. You know, just by just by she decent shielding because um, you're always going to be picking up noise. You know, from computers and lights and all kinds of stuff. But single coils do sound kind of cool. I mean, I've got this set at the moment. Um, it's a single coil at the back. And let's put it's both single coils. If I was to switch that to the back pickup, that's the that's that kind of single coil sound. Um, very Jacko-esque. Um, but then again, you can get Jacko, that Jacko sound. I mean, to be honest, you get more of a difference in the sound by selecting the different pickups. Like if you select the back pickup, you're more likely to get that kind of sound. It's, you know, whether it's single coil or split. Um, it was a Marcus Miller signature bass that I did all of that um, modding on. And I put it, it was DiMaggio Ultra Jazz pickups that I put in. And they're fat as all. I mean, they, they sound wicked. They're really powerful and big sound. But they don't have that uh, vintage kind of jazz bass sound. That's one thing to be aware of, that if you go for split coil over single coil, that if you want that vintage kind of sound, you're probably not going to get it. But if you want it, but if you solo the front pickup and you've got splits, then you're going to get more of the precision sound when you solo the front pickup. Using modes in jazz, this is Eric. Uh, do you think of each chord with its corresponding mode or the chords in the home key, for example, 251? Well, th th that gets to the chord scale thing, which I didn't d I didn't get into. But once you, once you know those modes in isolation, and then once you learn them relative to a major scale, so knowing that Dorian is mode number two and Lydian is mode number four, then when you see the chords... Two five one. You know that that's going to be. Let's say in C, it's going to be. You know, it's going to be D Dorian, G Mixolydian, and C major. But the only problem with thinking too modally in terms of diatonic chord progressions is that most jazz tunes, especially, have got at least some chromaticism in them. You know, if you talk about something like Autumn Leaves, right? It's not not Autumn Leaves. Um, All of Me. It's like about as basic a chord, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's not like giant steps or anything. I mean, it, it, you start on that C, you start on a C major, it's in the key of C major. Well, it starts on a C major, chord one, and the next chord, you know, is E7. Now, it doesn't sound weird at all, you know. But that is not in the key of C. So instantly you run into problems because you could say, oh, it's chord one, then chord three. Uh, okay, well, chord three is going to be Phrygian. Well, no, because it's a, it's got a major third in it. It's a E7. You can't play Phrygian over it. You can use Mixolydian. So you can kind of think of it like that. If you see a dominant seven, you can use a, a, mi a Mixolydian scale, but that's not, that doesn't tell you everything because you might want to use a flat second in there, in which case it's going to be a Spanish Phrygian scale. Now, I know that all the Berkeley crowd, uh, the way that it's taught there is that you kind of, um, 
you look at it diet in terms of the diatonic modes and then you just amend them based on whether it's chord three and whatever you know so you might put a flat second in it so oh, okay well this one's going to be a spanish frisian and this one's going to be a whatever but um you're better off thinking in those kind of circumstances you're better off just thinking chord tones rather than modes and then just treating everything else as kind of melodic devices around the chord tones. If you just stick to the chord tones over there, you know, I mean, you look at the actual melody. As you come down on that all of me at the beginning, that's root, fifth, and third of the chord. It's chord tones. Then you got a neighbor note on the C to the D. And then it just comes down the triad again on the E7. It's, it, it's all working around chord tones, and you can put chromatics around it and everything, but don't get too much into the mode thing in terms of chord scales. The, the, you can do it, and it, lots of people do, but you've got to be careful because of the chromatic chords. In jazz, you've got lots of chromatic chords. In pop music, you've got loads of chromatic chords. It's very rare you hear anything that doesn't have some kind of chromatic alteration. All right, fair enough, if it's like a Bob Dylan... Well, not even that. Even Dylan tunes do. But, like, I'm just thinking of some, like, 1-4-5 tunes. If you've just got 1-4 and 5, then you're probably going to be all right. But rest of the time... And even then, do you really want to be playing a Lydian scale over an F major chord in C? Maybe, but you're better off working around the chord tones rather than outlining some kind of Lydian vibe. You know, it's too complicated to start thinking on... Oh, you know, I'm playing over a one four five in C major, and I'm, I'm going to employ the Lydian mode. You know, what's the point? Um, right, I won't hang around too much. Um, Lydian and Mixolydian are major, rest are minor. Um, kind of. They 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 are based around the major triad and major chords. Dominant seven being a major type chord, if you if that's what you're meaning, major type. They're not major modes. The don't don't get confused by thinking Dorian, Phrygian, and Locrian are modes of the minor scale. No, no, they're all ma modes of the major scale. But forget the major scale. Forget how they relate to it to begin with. Just learn them in isolation, and it'll give you a better start with learning them. Unless you just want the theory behind it and you don't want to use them. You know, if you were going to have an exam and you need to do something about modes and where do modes come from well fair enough you don't need to know about the application then do you it's just for an exam i mean there's so much stuff that i learned at university that i will never use i will never think of it again it's a bit like learning ba you know aspects of math and stuff at, at school are you ever going to use it ever Lo loads of the stuff well that's the same with music the higher up you go in music education the more of it that you <laughs> That you learn that you're not going to look, you know, like Bartok set theory and, uh, you know, um, what was it? Schenkerian analysis and all that stuff. You don't um, have to use it that you, you just don't think of it afterwards. Hello, Mark. I'm currently learning with the help of the fundamental course. I wanted to do the Groove Trainer 1 and 2 afterwards, or should I deal with the Music Theory first? No, no, go for Groove Trainer 1 and 2. Uh, I think it depended on how long you've been playing. But if you've just started and then you've gone through beginner bass and then to basic fundamentals, then the Groove Trainer ones are a great one to move into. You don't want to get too bogged down in theory when you first start playing. I would advise any of you that are beginners to just start learning tunes. Just do that. If, if any one thing, you know, just learn loads of songs. Forget the styles. You know, if you're a metal fan, yeah, learn metal, but learn funk. Learn everything. Learn, learn, learn all the... F Go through all the different styles and learn, you know, like learn the most popular Beatles tunes, learn the most popular ABBA tunes, learn the most popular funk tunes, you know, find a, a disco album and, and learn those. Forget about what you like and what you don't like. If you just learn the basic standards in all of these different styles, learn some ska tunes, learn some of this, learn that. Just learn stuff, but make sure it's at your level because you, you can't always stick to one style uh, based on your level when you're a beginner, especially because if you're into technical death metal or something like that well you can't just start thrashing at that stuff out when you're a beginner so you've got to start somewhere so i would just recommend learning as many songs as you can learn one throw it away learn one throw it away you don't have to keep going over it i mean you can make a bit of a mixtape or playlist or whatever that's what i did when i was younger I just had these mixtapes that I used to make you know they didn't have enough cds in those days um so like late 80s early 90s i just have like a bunch of tunes that I knew that I could learn, like Metallica songs and things like that. 
And there were a few, I think there were a few police ones that I did in there. There was like a bunch of tunes. And I ju- and then I'd change it after a while. And then I just, that that was my practice session. I was just learning that. And it just got me playing. You know, that, that was the most important thing. Gets this hand working, gets this hand working. All the theory stuff is not that important at the start. You just want to get your hands moving, which is why I've done the groove train, of course. Because after you've done basic fundamentals and you've kind of got, you know, how to change your strings, you know how to do this, you know how to do that, got a little bit, you know, you know, a major scale. After you've done that, sometimes people don't know what, they don't have any resources to learn. They think, okay, well, if you're not really into any particular style or you or maybe some of the songs that you're learning are going to be, a, you, you don't know how to learn them because you might not have the music or, you know, tab or whatever. Well, that groove trainer gives you that option. It gives you a set of 60 grooves that you can learn in progressive order. That's why I made it. I thought, right, I, I'm always telling everybody how they need to learn a bunch of riffs and stuff, but I'm not giving any, um, any advice on what to learn, you know, which ones to, because there's, you know, it's the world of music. There's millions and millions of songs. So I thought, right, I'll do my own set of grooves that you can work through. And each one, as you work through progressively, has information in there. Harmony information technical information you know it starts out really really simple a lot of the first ones you'll probably think hold on i can play this this is really too easy but that's not the point you like even if it's something like this you know that i mean there aren't any that simple in there but let's say that's all it was there's a lot of things you can focus on technically there you know the movement of the thumb you know the tone you know getting a good tone for it just the the rhythm itself there's lots of things that you can focus on and then there's the actual the actual harmony in there lots of stuff so that's what the groove trainer course is all about sorry to digress so leading and passing is not the same uh no leading tone is that seventh is that seventh degree of the major scale it's the leading tone um Approach and passing are slightly different. Don't get too caught up in the melodic device naming stuff. Passing, yeah, passing between two chord tones. And then approach note, you're approaching a chord tone. Neighbor note, you're moving from one and back, you know. It's, there are, you've got appoggiaturas and achiacaturas and all these different kind of melodic devices. Don't get too caught up in it. It's it's just, basically, look at the chord tones. You've got that skeleton of them. And then you just, you can... You, you can just wiggle around them, you know, just just put scale notes around them or chromatics or whatever. It doesn't matter whether it's chromatic or not. It, as long as you're working around the chord tones, the chord tones are your safe notes. So whatever you do around them, you can do anything you want. But if you, you know, if you resolve to it, you'll be good. <laughs> um, Mark, I practice modes by key. That's fine. You know, that's how I teach it normally. I mean, on all the things that you see on YouTube by me about um, about modes, I actually teach the standard way of Major, Dorian, Frisian, Lydian. But I do know that a lot of people probably have problems learning it that way because they don't understand how to use it. Right, let me move down a bit. Do you like Marillion? I'm not a massive fan. Um... Uh, I am into a lot of prog stuff, uh, but um, it's funny enough, I was talking to, you know, when I was doing the interview with John Poole last week, he was talking about the potential for Dowling Pool to do the, uh, at all with Marillion. Um, I like Kaylee and, you know, Lavender and all that stuff, but I, uh, I've not, I've never actually sat and listened through any of the Marillion albums I, I ought to do, because I'm, you know, I'm into Genesis and Yes, and I'm into a lot and um, It Bites and Stephen Wilson's one of my favorite musicians ever, and you know. Uh, oh, let me just jump down. Um, oh, by the way, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I'm I keep ignoring the uh, the uh, super chat things. Uh, so thanks, Carlo, Dave, and uh, I saw another one there. Thanks, uh, Bass and Bass. Did Alan Holdsworth think his solos out? Cat was incredible. Um, what do you mean? Did he work them out beforehand? No, 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 no. That's pure improvisation. He never, he never works them out before. Thank you, Mark. You've really upped my bass game up. Andy's doing a concert tomorrow at the Civic Centre. Nice one. How's your uh, remodeling in the new place going? Oh, 
It's not. I mean, we we bought. Just in case anybody didn't know, we bought this house. Um, it's my first house, um, and it's uh, a renovation job. So it's. <laughs> We're having to, I mean, there's nothing left of it apart from the outer walls. It was a complete and utter catastrophe. So, you know, subterranean water going through. It's like six inch deep underneath. We've taken every single wall down. We've taken every single floor out. We've taken all the roof out, everything. All the drains, there were rats coming in because there was all the drainage was broken. It's a complete, you know, complete cock up. And we've, uh, we're having to work our way through. But it's taking, it's taking, it's taking time. So we have not moved in yet. Um, um, do it life, I lose motivation, but when you do these hangs, I get more focused and inspired. Cool, because I'm going to be doing more of them. So I'm probably going to do a... Um, uh, one weekly. I'm definitely going to do one a week. Uh, can you please help me how my fingers can be more relaxed on the fretboard? I talked about that right at the start, actually. Just take your finger, bring it down on one, and you'll find that you don't have to hold them down. Just You just have to literally think, play lighter. I'm, I'm just playing as light as I can. And that, that helps with, the, the, you know, when you're whipping across. If you're moving across on like an arpeggio or something, you have to be really light in the fingers, like like that. It's, that was terrible. Um, the, light, the faster you want to go across, the the lighter you want to play, but you just have to think relaxed. But to be lighter in that hand, you're going to have to be lighter in this hand. You can't just be hard on one hand. You've got to be light in both hands. But you just have to concentrate on doing it. How relaxed should my fretting hand be? I tend to be cramped up when playing. As relaxed as you can be. Um, you know, I've had that where I've cramped up playing. because I've Usually because I've not got the amp turned up enough. Sometimes you overplay because you're not loud enough. You know, like when you're playing on stage and everybody's playing and they're all really loud and they all get louder. A guitarist turns up, he starts, you know, he starts turning his amp up. Drummer starts playing louder. You know, guitar starts turning up a bit more. And then you're like, oh, I can't hear myself. So you start turning up, but you don't turn up enough and you just can't hear yourself or you don't even realize they've turned up and you're like, man, I can't. And sometimes it's even, you don't even notice. All that starts happening is you go from that to, to that and you don't even realize. And if you start tightening up in this hand, then you start tightening up in that hand and then you start cramping up. So um, sometimes if it's live, it can be down to that thing that happens <laughs> and it happens all the time i can't hear myself turning up i can't hear myself turning up i can't hear myself everybody's doing it guitarist oh man i, just, I can't hear myself you know because drums are playing you know drums playing louder than they did in the sound check so the guitarist starts turning up as soon as guitarist starts turning up or a keyboard player then all of a sudden it's like oh i can't hear myself i turn up and then they turn up and then they turn up and before you know it you've got this competition between all of them and then nobody's even saying it it's not like they're all thinking oh i need to turn up because of them it's like oh, I, don't, I don't know i can't hear myself and by the end of the gig everybody's like on il 11 <laughs> <laughs> this one goes to 11 uh all right coming down to the bottom so i'll be gone in probably about five minutes so any last requests <laughs> um hello augustus yep yeah, going out for a gig nice one um i want to purchase some strings for slap bass is a light gauge round one for p bass and i just installed the mg so uh solderless pickups any suggestions for a combo for both what a combo as in an amp it doesn't really matter it's just to be honest i just use medium gauge i've tried all gauges i've tried all kinds of things. And at the end of the day, it never really makes that much difference. I just, <laughs> I just, I just, 
you know, you, if I was to pick up a bass, any bass, it's just going to be the same. I mean, some. I mean, all right, fair enough. The difference between flat wound and round wound, or dead strings and live lively strings for slap, or if it's set up badly and you've got fret bus everywhere or not, you know, or the action's up and down. But bass, I don't get too caught up in the gear thing anymore. It's um, I did for quite a while while I was doing a lot more gigging and i was like oh i need uh, you always think you need something else but most of the time you don't you just need an amp that's loud enough to be honest that's 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 the uh, if i was giving any <laughs> any amount of advice to anybody that was going out and if they don't have any monitors i'd say just make sure that the amp's loud enough don't even worry about the size of the speaker or anything like that just make sure it's loud enough without it farting out you know because once you start playing loud, everything just turns into a mush. Your ears start getting affected. And what starts out sounding like this lovely sound ends up sounding like, Bzz. you know, bass just is, Bzz. and it, it, that's all it turns into eventually. You, your ears just become numb to it. Uh, ship ahoy. He's teaching you how to fish for yourself instead of having someone fish for you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, by the way, I'm, gonna, I'm doing a few more interviews coming up. So I did John Paul the other day, who's one of my heroes. Uh, this week, I'm going to have Josh Fosgreen on. So, uh, in fact, Josh Fosgreen on Monday and Charles Berteau, or, you know, the pro, that's Thursday. So I've got a few, uh, a few cool interviews. I shouldn't have given that away, should I really? But, uh, yeah. They're the two guys that I've got coming up. I'm going to try and get Billy Sheen and Stu Ham as well. I mean, they've both said yes in the past, and then I never followed through on it. So um, they're another two. Um, you need to listen to more Marillion. Okay. Is that his raw signal? How does it sound so good? What, you mean me? <laughs> I didn't think it sounded good. I thought it sounded pretty naff. I've got a lot of fret buzz at the moment. Look, Watch this. I did this last live hang as well. It's completely burning. The frets are, need fret stoning again. But... but if, and actually... Yeah, the uh, it, I need to set the truss rod again. But look, watch this. I'm going between two frets there, and it stays on the same one. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm sure you don't mean my, I sound good. Um, but, um, yeah, it is raw signal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. NAM next weekend. Yeah, I won't be at NAM this year. Um, I've got too much going on, but with all that stupid house thing going on, and um, yeah, I'm skint. I can't. I can't be <laughs> flying out to to America for a you know basically a piss up. Um, can you do a lesson on borrowed chords? Um, yeah, I will do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean borrowed from the relative minor, I guess. Uh, sorry, parallel minor. Um, Uh, you're going to do hangs on Saturday at the same times. So, uh, you think uh, uh, maybe, yeah. Uh, I think Saturday's generally the better time because everybody's going to be nobody's at work, you know. Or you know, not everybody. I am. <laughs> <laughs> How do some bands achieve such a great separation between the guitar and bass in the mix? For example, Red Hot Chili Peppers have a great sound because the instruments feel like they don't mix and clash. Do you mean on the albums? forget about it when it comes to albums that's completely in the hands of producers it makes absolutely no difference what you're going to do um the if you mean live that's a little bit different but it's all it's all in the you know they use it's all the forms of compression that you they use uh the eq in of it the, in terms of mixing and, and getting sounds on an album um that's a completely that's an art that you unless you get into into recording and production uh you're just going to be chasing your tail with that 
um, because they, you know, the, the the sound that you get usually in a recording is uh, the one that works to get it in the mix. You know, when you EQ it and you compress it and all that stuff, uh, and the sounds that you get to make it work in conjunction with each other is often not at all what you would want soloed. So you sit there trying to get a sound and thinking, oh, this is this sounds really good, and then. You know, a producer's going to make it sound awful to your ears, but then when you hear it in the mix, it's like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. Uh, are you still following MMA? Yep. Uh, are you watching tonight's fight? Yep, yep. Yeah, you always ask me what my predictions are. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Alex Pereira is going to beat Izzy again. Uh, and I'd like Masvidal to beat Burns, but... I don't know. I just can't see him knocking him out. Or submitting him. Which means it's just going to have to be like a points win. And I, I just don't know if... I don't know. My head there goes burns. Yeah. What kind of amp are you using now? Well, none here. I'm just going straight into the into a Yamaha AG06 interface. Um... Uh, in terms of uh, the, an amp, um, I've got a, but well, sat there doing nothing. It's a GR bass. We've got a 2B, I've got a uh, two, 2B12 two speaker cabs and a head. So it's about 1,000 watts the head. No, it isn't. It's about, is it 800? I can't remember. Mids uh, saved my life thanks to your uh, uh, playing in a band, thanks to your advice. Yep, Mids are your friend. You start turning up, you start turning up your volume and your bass and all that stuff, and it starts farting out, and you're like, oh, I still can't hear myself. But you turn it all down, turn your mids up, and you'll come straight through the mix. Might not sound particular, might not be the sound that you want in terms of the tone, but if you're having problems hearing yourself and cutting through in the mix, mids are the way to go. Roughly around 200 hertz. Cool. All right, then, everybody. So that was great. Um, I'll get moving. And uh, like I say, I'll probably do one again next week. Um, uh, remember, like I said, there's the sale on over at Talking Bass, uh, just in case you didn't know. I'm guessing most of you know. So it's 25% um, off everything. Uh, so if you want to deep dive in all this stuff that I've been talking about, there's plenty of courses over there. Um, and if you've already done a course, then you probably... I'm guessing we'll probably want to do another because, uh, you know, there's a lot of info. And that's the thing with the courses, you know, like I've put so much into these courses that like I sometimes think I'm kind of doing, I don't know, it's almost like I'm putting too much stuff in them <laughs> because, you know, you, you buy one of the courses for like 50 quid and um, or a or even 100, 110 for the full Chord Tone Essentials. But I mean, that's only a few one-on-one -on -one lessons, isn't it? You know, when you actually think about how much people charge for one-on-one -on -one lessons these days, and you're getting, like, a pretty much a music college education out of those courses, so, you know, which costs you hundreds of thousands of pounds, so I've kind of probably down... They're probably not... Well, nobody would buy them if I made them really expensive, would they? But, uh, yeah, anyway, so there's the sale on there over at Talking Bass, um, and uh, that's it. So, cool. All right, then, thanks, everybody, and I'll probably... I might see you next week. So, see you later.